are doing? Praise Jesus. Come on, give him a hand clap and praise him. Lord, we love you. We give you honor tonight. You are wonderful. You are magnificent. Splendid King. Amen. Welcome to the Wednesday night meeting, uh, Church of Life Ministries here at the shelter. And we're in for a treat tonight. Pastor Paul is going to be sharing the word, and we're going to have a time of worship and allow the Holy Spirit to do whatever he wants to do. So let's come into agreement about that, that we're here to meet with God and for God to touch us. And if we all have the same purpose and same mind, then we're all together in one place, in one accord. And you know what happens when you have that? The Holy Spirit comes, and his power is poured out on us. And so that's what we're here for. And I put it in the words all the time because I want to make it clear to God and to man. And so we welcome God's spirit. We follow him. He's our leader. He's our everything. He's our king. And wherever he goes, we're going to go. Whatever he does, we want to do that. Amen? Amen. Why don't you stand to your feet with me? Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay.
wonderful. We love you, Lord. Sing this with me. The day is brighter. The day is brighter.
heavy burden, you have something heavy on your shoulders, and you're saying, God, release me. Come, just come, come into his presence. Come in deeper. Come in deeper, and you will have your release. Come, come in deeper. He's saying, children, I'm going to free you. I'm going to free you. Come, reach out to my hand.
unleashing out breakthroughs for many of us. He's handing out breakthroughs. Come on, people, let's receive your breakthrough from him. Receive your breakthrough from him this very night. <laughs> you press in the breakthrough. He's already here. The Lord is handing out his breakthroughs to you. Um, I'm so proud of my team because uh, they really have been used greatly by God and such a great team. Um, we went to Taipei and this city called Zhongli and the Lord used us uh, greatly. The Lord poured off His Spirit and I just want to highlight to you certain incidents. For example, um, on a Saturday morning, two Saturday morning ago, we were um, leading a prayer meeting and, um, and the Lord really came upon the people. The Lord used Caleb to deliver uh, a person, I think, who has been demonized. And um, the Lord used the rest of the team to pray for many people. And then in the midst of the prayer meeting, I saw a vision of a lady in a yellow shirt. And I asked Shireen, I said, is that such a lady? She said, no. I said, okay, never mind. Four minutes later, this lady appeared. And Shireen brought me to pray for her, pray for her, she was ministered and she was crying and after that she came to me and said, Pastor, can I friendly see you in the afternoon? I said, can. Okay. 4 p.m. Uh, she brought a lady friend along and uh, our team ministered to this lady, lady friend. Now this lady friend has cancer and she was very stressed and she was very distressed and she told us that actually that very morning she was um, making a decision she says she has two choices. Either she go and serve God or go and die. And she has attempted suicide be be before. So she was sharing with us about her life and I didn't really catch what she was saying because she was crying, she was sobbing. See, she came from a conservative uh, church background. She didn't know what, is, what it meant to be touched by the Spirit. And then Esther got her ready, we, we laid hand on her and she fell on the floor. And she was down on the floor resting for 20 minutes. Now her yellow shirt friend was very worried. She said, is my friend all right? I said, don't worry. And then she was resting and resting. At the end of the 20 minutes, she stood up. And my team saw that her eyes were different. Her eyes sparkled with life. And she said this, Oh, it's just like I've been resurrected to live, to live a new life. Praise God. I did counsel her. It was the power of the Lord. The next few days, the Holy Spirit came powerfully in the services. And then we went to two prisons. Went to the guy's prison and, uh, and there was no officer there. They were just watching us through the camera. But it was good. Nobody in charge. No, the boys were mischievous and we couldn't catch 
much of the attention, but some of them really were interested and we prayed for them, some of them were touched by the Lord, and it was, it was sort of disorganized, but it was a good in, interactive time. Then the second day, we went to the ladies' pre prison. Very organized, 100 of them were, were there waiting for us. Bah. And uh, there was some miscommunication and all. Uh, but Angela has a powerful testimony, and some of the ladies was, were touched by her testimony. They were crying and things like that. But we left the prison a little bit sad. Say, oh, what a wasted effort, no? And that night was the last meeting. We have a prayer meeting at the Taipei Church. Wow. I didn't really know what to do. I was half joking with the team. Oh, pray that God will heal my heart because I was very disappointed with the prison visit. And I took up the kit, I took the kit, the kita at night um, uh, during the prayer meeting. And when I started to play the first few Chinese songs, wow, the Spirit of the Lord came. It was so powerful. And uh, so many of them would were, 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 were touch, and I and I already saw that the Lord had um, fulfilled His word uh, in Angela because a lady, uh, an Indian lady prophesied over her two months ago that she would go to Taiwan with fire. Oh, I never seen Angela like that before. Oh, she <laughs> lay hand on the girls and she fire, and the girls scream, Wah! and then and then she she lay hand on one of the girl. Uh, whom I prayed for earlier, and the girl started to go into a trance. No, she, she was she was closing her eyes, but she was like dancing, singing, and she was singing things like that. Ti tu ta 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 ta. You know, you know, like I was a small little child dancing around, and she was like that for two two hour plus. And we know that the Lord has touched her with her eyes closed. We were just dancing, running around, things like that. So we thank God. It was a very good trip. Um, uh, we ate a lot. Um, Taiwan. <laughs> we, we ate like crazy, uh, and then the last two days we had fun, and um, uh, we went sightseeing, and Caleb was telling me, wow, Paul, sightseeing is more time than ministry, yeah, I agree. <laughs> but we have a very good, good, very, very good trip, and we will go, go back there again, all right? Thanks for praying with us. I will really bring you this good, good report. Now, today, tonight, I'm going to share uh, on this thing called Anointing Plus. Now, you see, the Lord has been speaking to us uh, through our theme verse, Daniel chapter 11, verse 32b, that is, those who know that God shall be strong and, uh, uh, and they shall carry out great exploits. Now, um, I've seen us deepening our relationship with God, I've seen us being growing stronger and stronger, and I've, I've seen people doing mighty exploits. And uh, those of you who go to Cambodia, those in the Taiwan trip, and those in your own uh, Office and, and so on. I've heard of good good reports that we are doing great exploits. But um, with all this seeking the Lord and receiving His anointing and doing great exploit, I think we must be mindful of some other things. And tonight, at this juncture of our church life, is as is exactly half the year, no? right? This is the first Wednesday meeting of the second half of the year. All right, and. Um, Oh, no, no, still, still, no, so the last, we are still in the first half of the year, sorry, but we have reached June, right? And so, and uh, I felt that the Lord is like telling us that, yeah, beside all this, we need to be mindful of a few things. And I tell you, if you forget everything that I've said today, I'm talking about being united in love and purpose. That, that is very important. Being united in love and in purpose. All right, it is so so very important, and I have, uh, and the Lord has led me to a passage in Philippians chapter two, and we shall read that. Okay, now let me read to you first uh, Philippians chapter two, verse one to four. Paul say, now I'm, re I'm reading in the New Living Translation. Okay, now Paul say, if uh, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? any comfort from His love, any fellowship together in the Spirit, are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then, make me truly happy by agreeing with each other wholeheartedly, loving one another, and working together with one mind and one purpose. And then he, he, he goes on and say, do not be selfish, don't impress, don't try to impress others, but be humble and always consider others uh, as better than yourself. Do not look into your interests only, but look into the interests of others too. Now, why did Paul write all this in Philippians chapter 2? Now, there seems to be some tension in the church. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 2, 
right? Paul appealed to two ladies. These two ladies were quite uh, prominent in the church. And he said, now I appeal to you, uh, Euodia and Cynthia, please, because of Christ, settle, because you belong to Christ, settle your disagreement. There seems to be some tension in the church. And therefore, Paul, in the book of Philippians, he wrote uh, these few verses down. Now tonight, if you take a look at verse 1, Paul distinctively talks about four qualities of a Christian and of a church. Then in verse 2, he expressed his desire for the church. In verse 3 and 4, he laid down four more specific instructions. And as I was looking through these simple verses, I suddenly realized that many times Christian groups and churches got into big troubles because we fail to apply these verses. Maybe we feel that these verses are too simple. But if you look carefully, if a church truly apply these verses, there will be great unity in love and purpose. Alright, so let me go through it part by part, okay? Now verse 1, Paul talks about four things. Now he asks a series of questions, but it was not actually uh, a series of questions. It was some kind of implications. He, he was like saying, there should be, um, within you, there, 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 there should be encouragement from belonging to Christ. And then there should be comfort from his love. And the next two things deal with the church life. Oh, there should be fellowship together in the spirit and there should be tenderness and compassion towards one another. Now, belonging to Christ, encouragement should come when we belong to Christ. Why? Of course. My spirit is encouraged every morning when I wake up and I know that I belong to the King of Kings, the creator of the universe. I belong to, I, I, I belong to the savior of the universe. Oh, wouldn't that encourage you? I mean, we know, right? Many people like to turn on the radio early in the morning and listen to some sex song. But I, when I wake up, I know I belong to Christ. And my spirit is really very encouraged. Now, see, I travel a lot these few years. And um, I'm very, I'm very um, pleased with my small little red passport. Because this small little red Singapore passport is welcome in many places. Uh, I don't need to apply for a visa to, to many countries. I can just walk straight in. You know, China, they levy visas on almost everybody except Singaporeans. We can walk into China for 15 days without a visa. And uh, I feel very proud of that small red book. And, 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 I've, and, I've, and I know that there are some people from some countries, they were, mis they were straight away mistreated at the airport because of that passport. Now, so you see, belonging to Singapore really encouraged me. How much more when I know that I belong to Christ? Oh, people, we belong to Christ. We belong to Him. We belong to the one who created the whole universe. Wouldn't there be encouragement? Surely there would be, right? Next, Paul talked about, uh, is there any comfort from his love? Now this English word comfort is actually um, not so much about, oh, oh, you, 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 you feel sad now, let me sayang you. No? It's not, 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 not this kind of thing, not, not a soothing kind. Comfort actually comes from the root word called strengthening the fault. C O M F O R T, right? It's strengthening the fort. When this old English word comfort is being used, it means strengthening. Not so much of our modern day context, oh no, sayang, sayang. It's not like that. Right? It's more about strengthening. Now, his love really strengthened me. Because his love is so pure, his love is so great, he really strengthened me. And we know that strong children come from loving family. You, you, you see children growing up to be strong because they have a loving family. And you see children being dysfunctional when their family has no love. And I remember that 1995 morning when I was preparing myself to be operated uh, in the Kuala Lumpur Hospital in Malaysia, when I was so frightened, the Lord woke me up and He strengthened me with His love. 
He poured off his love onto me that day. That I could go through that, that surgery that, uh, that uh, was so traumatic and, uh, and learn a very powerful le lesson for, for my life. All because of the love of Christ that strengthened me. Now, so Paul talks about the personal thing. No, there should be encouragement because you belong to Christ. And there should be comfort and strengthening because of his love. Now he turns his, his, his attention now to the church. Is there fellowship together in the spirit? Now the Greek understanding of this word fellowship is very deep. To us, sometimes we may have watered down the term fellowship. But I thank God the other day, I heard that on Saturday, uh, my, uh, our Saturday young adults, we have discussion about what is fellowship and outing, and you gave a very good definition of fellowship and outing. Outing just outing, but fellowship we come together to share our lives. Now, the Greek understanding of the word fellowship is deep. Let me give you an example. There was a British preacher by the name of David Paulson. He went to Greece. He was preaching among the pastors, and after the, the, the service, he was having a meal with them. He, on his right hand, he was holding a sandwich, and then he turned to the left, and he spoke to a Greek pastor. But while, while he was speaking to the Greek pastor, another pastor on his right bit off part of his sandwich. <laughs> and he was shocked. He turned around, looked at the pastor, the pastor just smiled, and he bit off the, the, the sandwich again. You know why? Because the Greek understanding of fellowship means, I share your food, you share my food. Oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know that sometimes we feel, oh no, we can share saliva, oh no, no. Oh, we, you, we can't take that long. But see, 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 Paul was saying there should be deep fellowship, deep communion between each other in the spirit. And then he go on to say, um, are your hearts tender and compassion, compassion, uh, compassionate? Now, I thank God that Christianity has always been marked and characterized by love. I look at all those movies and Hong Kong dramas, whenever they portray a church, oh, it's always a loving place. Thank God for that. Why? Because Christ is tender, Christ is merciful, Christ is full of compassion. And when He's in us, His tenderness and compassion should flow out. Right. That's why I cannot believe in nasty Christians. I was shocked sometimes when I see my, my friends oh, uh, behaving nas very, in a very nasty way in the restaurants. I was very shocked to see them shouting at the waiters. And I, I wondered to myself, how could this be? If Christ is in us, His tenderness and compassion should flow out from us. Then, therefore, it's not right to say, oh, I'm like that means I'm like that. I have, I have been born with this nasty temperament, therefore, I'm nasty. But do we believe that God can transform us from glory to glory? Yes. yes. God can transform us from glory to glory. If we say that we, we are melancholic, God can transform that. If we can't say that, oh, I'm choleric, I'm a high D person, I always command people to move, to go around, then God can fill that in with His tenderness and compassion. Because Christ is in us, therefore, His tenderness and compassion can flow out. The only thing is, do we allow that to happen? Do we want to work with the Lord to have Him transform our hearts? To allow the tenderness and compassion to flow out. You know, when we were in Taiwan, um, we were quite surprised that um, many of the ladies and the girls spoke in a very tender way. When we go to the shops, they will say this, Hello, you mean Jing Lai Oh? You can't just don't see oh, and I'll can oh you wait just doesn't work, can't you hall? No, basically we're just saying please come in and take a look. And the way they, they, they speak is please come in oh, please come in, come in and see this, okay? Oh, every girl speak like that. I'm just wondering to myself, how come they all speak like that? Now maybe it's a mass media. Maybe the mass media has portrayed uh, the Taiwanese girls to be speaking like that and everybody everybody pick up that so-called tenderness. And Caleb and I, we were like, oh, <laughs> goose people all over. Well, why are they all speaking like that? <laughs> now, if the mass media can influence these girls to speak like that, Christiness definitely can influence us to be more tender and compassionate. Now, Paul said that these four qualities should be in the church. Now, how, how does this link up with my, my theme or link up with verse 2? 
He said, then, make me very happy. Make me very happy. Agree with each other wholeheartedly, love one another, and work together with one mind and one purpose. See, I feel that verse 2 must flow up from verse 1. Of course, logically, if there's no verse 1, there's no verse 2, right? But, you see, verse 2 has to flow up from verse 1. Verse 2 cannot exist if there's no verse 1. If there's no these four qualities, it's hard to agree with each other wholeheartedly. You see, Paul was saying, there should be these four qualities in the church, and therefore, therefore, please, agree with each other wholeheartedly. Now, I'm not saying therefore all of us will, will conform to one another and we become conformists, you know, everybody uh, wear a nice spectacle like me, you know, everybody <laughs> will wear a black t-shirt like Les Tipico, you know, uh, then, no, then, 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 there, there, then there's no uniqueness, no, I'm not saying this. But what Paul is saying, agree, agree in the spirit. Have this unity and love one another and work together with one mind and one purpose because of the four qualities that we should have. We should have encouragement from belonging to Christ. We should have strengthening and comfort from His love. We should have fellowship, strong fellowship. We should have tenderness and compassion towards one another. Therefore, we can agree wholeheartedly with one another we can love one another and we can work together with one mind and one purpose. Now, re recently I've just spoken to someone and that person told me her recollection of a certain event. And I knew that when she told me about that event, I knew that somewhere there, there was one detail that was wrong. Now in the past, I'll be very quick and say, hey, sorry, you're wrong. I, because I'll be very quick to make right the thing. But I've learned through the years, sometimes it's alright. You know why? Because I want to love a person and I'm going to work with a person with one mind one purpose. Now I'm not saying that I will totally compromise, but that was only a small detail. And I know that the person was not ready to hear the small detail right. And if that day I would have uh, force my way in and say, no, 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 your presentation of this matter is wrong. I think it would have caused her to uh, maybe dig up the past hurts and maybe, and then we'll have, we'll unravel some tension between her and her friends and then we may not be able to work together. Uh, so I kept quiet. By, by, by keeping quiet, am I agreeing? Some sort. But I've, I've learned to, to love. You know what the Bible talks about? Speaking the truth in love. The devil can speak the truth no? but without love. Sure. First Samuel 28, the spirit that came up to uh, talk to Saul, definitely it was not the spirit of Samuel. He was a demonic spirit. And the spirit told Saul the truth. But no love. And Saul was left demoralized. He couldn't even get up from the ground. But the spirit of the Lord the spirit of prophecy is to encourage. Now, so, 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 so therefore, I've learned this thing. Love is more important. Speak the truth in love. If you don't have love, don't speak the truth. Because if you speak the truth, you may just hurt someone. Speak the truth in love. Now, Paul expressed his desire in, in verse 2. And he said, this is my desire for the church. Agree with each other wholeheartedly, love one another, and work together with one mind and one purpose. This church has been with him for a long time. No? If you take a look at verse one, uh, chapter one, verse five, he said, "From the beginning, which from the beginning of planting of the church, you have been partnering with me." It, and by the time when Paul wrote this letter, he said, "I think it was about ten years late, late, It was about ten years later. So they have been partnering with him for ten years. He, this church was very dear to him." Actually, it was the first European church that Paul planted. Right? You, you, can read, you can read that in Acts. Okay? Now, so Paul saying, there should be these four qualities, verse 1, and uh, therefore, because of these four qualities, please agree with each other, go heartily, love one another, and work together in unity. And he, and, and he goes on, I lay down for you four more instructions. Do not be selfish. Do not try to impress others. 
If you read other version, it's what do not do not have selfish ambition and don't do things out of vain conceit. Now it is very easy to put in your our own selfish desire into the church agenda or into the church project. It is very simple. It's very easy to do that. But Paul warns us to not be selfish. No, selfishness is the first thing that would destroy unity. Have you ever seen a soccer team made up of wonderful star players, but do you realize that they often cannot perform? Why? Because everybody is trying to outshine each other. Everybody is trying to promote their selfish ambition. Everybody is trying to score the goal. Nobody wants to pass the ball to the other person. When they pick the ball, they will try to dribble their way to the goal and, and put the goal into the net because they are all star players. Oh, every star player should be scoring. So nobody wants to have teamwork. That's why if you put up a soccer team full of star players, usually they cannot perform because everybody is selfish with their own ambition, trying to impress each other. And in the, in the past, I've learned my lesson well. Maybe in the past, as I was a young youth pastor, maybe the only blind youth pastor in Singapore, and uh, sometimes I, I come from a small church, I, I feel insecure. And therefore, whenever I attend those big meetings with other pastors, I find myself trying to put in some last words to a conversation to impress people. Or maybe trying to do something, say something to get some attention to myself. And all this stemmed out from insecurity. And as I evaluated back, it was selfish. I was trying to promote myself. And I, I know that it is something that the Lord would not like. And that's why the Lord has to teach me a hard lesson. Now, Paul would then go on to say the second instruction, be humble and always think of others better than yourself. It's a simple instruction, but I can tell you it's not easy to follow. <laughs> Agree? Especially for us who are leaders. Now let me share you what I learned in the Taiwan trip. On the first Friday night when we have 10 person gathering in our hall, in our hotel room. The Lord moved, we pray for a lot of people, and towards the end, the Lord impressed with my heart that He would only use Esther to pray for a lady. Now, I have three choices. Number one, ignore the prompting, go straight to the lady and pray. Number two, bring Esther along, and when things happen, I can claim a little bit of glory. Number three, number three, listen to the Lord, be humble, consider her better than me, as the Lord has directed, and say, go. And so, I told Esther, go. The Lord will use you to free this lady. She went, she prayed for the lady. The lady was ministered. She cried like crazy, and she was healed in her heart. And I believe strongly that if that night I go over and lay hand on her to pray, nothing will happen. See, it's a very humbling lesson. But if the Lord says so, then let's learn to be humble, and consider others better than us. Because you know why? I've learned this thing in my counseling training in 96. Always be others focused. Now we learned a very powerful lesson. If I cannot handle a counseling uh, after four sessions, I must quickly refer the counseling to another more capable counselor. Because the focus is not on me, the focus is on the counseling. And, then, and therefore, when I refer the counselling to someone else who is better uh, trained than me, I, I shouldn't go away, oh poor, oh, you can't counsel her, oh, what a shame, no. Because the focus should be on the counselling. If I cannot handle her, I better pass her to, to someone else, or else I would have messed up her life. So this is the, the, the same thing, that is when it comes to ministry, I think we have to be others Focus. We have to focus on, our, on the other people and not so much on myself. If I lay hand on a person and the person is not healed, then if I know that God has anointed someone, then I better bring someone to pray for the person because it's not about me. It's not about, oh, poor, poor, you, can, you cannot heal him. But it's about the person who needs the healing. Therefore, it is, it is, it is uh, great to learn how to consider others better than us. And for the team, I don't know whether you realize this, on a Tuesday night, um, towards the end, I just pick up a kid 
keep dancing and I asked your good minister. Yeah, I was tired, but I also know that God has sent you off to Taiwan with a purpose. And I want to see God um, empowering you and I want to see God using you mightily. That's why I purposely took a vaccine. Because I want to learn this lesson. Consider others better than yourself. Yeah, I'm the pastor, I'm the leader, but so what? If the Lord said that He's going to use Angela with fire, then let it be through. Therefore, give her the opportunity to go and pray for others. As a pastor, I could have hawked up the whole, whole show. Oh, come, come, come. I'm the pastor, come, I let me pray for you. Right? And I tell you, the people say, yeah, yeah, please go queue up, queue up that line, the pastor line. Right? They, they, they want to be prayed by pastors. But as a leader, I think I must learn to be humble and always consider others better than myself. I mean, that's the spirit. Now, think about this. If Christians, if we Christians, if we churches learn to apply this every time, I think we can spare ourselves from many ugly church splits. I think we can spare ourselves from many ugly situations. I heard of church leadership meeting when people throw cups at each other. <laughs> I can't understand. Why get angry with, so, with each other so much that we throw cups at each other? If we only apply what Paul says here, consider the other person better than ourselves, how much pain we will have saved ourselves from. And Paul goes on to say, do not look into your own interests only but look into the interest of other people. Also, the, from the trip, yeah, we must always not look into your own interests and must always look into the interests of others only. I affirm one of my, one of my, my, my teammates, you know, whenever I preach, I need a lot of water. I don't know why my throat goes thirsty so easily. I look at Steve Dugo, he doesn't need to drink water. I don't know why I need to drink so much. <laughs> Maybe I'm more heaty, huh? <laughs> Now, that, now that, that more, you see, when I went up stage to, to preach, one of, the, one of my, my teammates um, put a cup in front of me on the pulpit and she, and she said, the cup is here. So I said, great. No? But when I touch the cup, I said, oh no, it's those cups with a plastic cover. And I was thinking to myself, where's the straw? <laughs> and would I create a distraction? No? 100 over pairs of eyes will stare at me as I try to... <laughs> but when I touch the cup, oh! The straw was nicely poking. And I thank God for her because she really looked into my interests. And because of that, I, I don't have to create a distraction. You see, so when we look into each other's interests, oh, how nice would that be? Now, four simple instructions. Don't be selfish. Be humble. Don't look into your own interests, but look into the interests of others. You see, from verse 1 to verse 4, Paul laid down so much things for the church. He knew that the church has some tension. And he just prescribed these simple advices and instructions for them. And sometimes we may think to ourselves, can, um, can problems in the church be solved so easily? Think about it. It can be. If only we dare to apply what God says. For example, Jesus said, when you realize that a brother has sinned against you, you go to the brother and reconcile before you come to worship God. Now the world will say, if you have sinned against the other guy, go and, go and apologize. If the guy sinned against you, let the guy come to you. But Jesus said, the other, the other way around. If you realize that guy has sinned against you, you go to the person first. Now, if all Christians would apply this, I can tell you a lot of church problems, church splits would have been avoided. It is that simple, but yet challenging. So, at this juncture, why do I want to talk about this? It's because we are growing stronger. We are doing more great things for the Lord. The thing to watch out for is unity in love 
and purpose. The, the thing to watch out um, for and to, to really protect ourselves against is disunity and tension and conflicts. And I'm sure as we grow, when there are more and more people walking in, here and there, we will rub shoulders with one another. We will. Even in the Taiwan trip, we do rub shoulders with one another. Now, but how do we handle that? You know, there, do you know that there's, there was a church in history that was endowed with all spiritual gifts and they were powerful. Can you make a guess? Which church was, was it? Which church was that? So, they were powerful. But what a mess they make up, they, they, they have among themselves. They have quarrels. They fight against each other. The, the rich man will eat and leaving the poor man staring at them eating. They have all kinds of dissension. Powerful, but fragmented. Powerful, but they have lots of problems. Now, I really don't want to see church alive becoming a powerful church, but with lots of problems. I think we must humble ourselves and guard ourselves and uh, listen to the advice of Paul. And truly, truly, let's be united in love and in purpose. And then we can be a strong church. I'm not so really interested in a big church, but I'm interested in a strong, united, loving church. I'm very glad to partner with Steve Nico. I think he's one of the most humblest guy I ever seen. If there's such a word, <laughs> I, I, I thank God. I mean, he's anointed, you know, but but I, I thank God for the good partnership that I, I have with him. Um, I, 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 I don't know. I don't really understand when they say he learned things from me. I'm a blind person. I don't know what, what, what he's learning from me. But I've learned so much from him, and I'm glad that we partner uh, with each other very well. And I, I thank God for the humility that's in him. Alright? Now, in conclusion, Paul said, our model should be of that of Jesus. Now, Steve, could you read for me? Sure. Uh, verse 5 to verse 11. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. All right. Now, so you see, I, I think we, we don't need to explain much from this verses. We can see for ourselves, Jesus came and he came to serve and not to be served. He came to be born as a human. He, he forgo the, the divine privileges that he enjoyed in heaven. He came down and was born in a manger. He chose the difficult path. He didn't appear out of nowhere as a 30-year-old man. And bring Hi, I'm the savior of the world. <laughs> he chose to be born as a helpless baby. You know, somebody make a comparison, but um, but some people um, um, couldn't accept this comparison. Now, uh, if I were to use it, okay, let me use it to just bring the message across, but I have deep reverence for Jesus, okay? okay but I just want to bring this Crude example. For example, maybe you see a brood of chick chicken and they're lost and they're fighting. And then you transform yourself forever to be a chicken to, to save them. How does that sound? Jesus came down from heaven and was and he came in the shape of a man. That's what he went through. And the wounds on his flesh, on his body, on his hand, on his legs are still there. 
when he resurrected, he showed Thomas his wounds. And uh, in Revelation, we read, we we'll look at the one they have pierced. That means his pierced wound is still there. And Christ has gone through so much. He humbled himself so much and obeyed the Father to the point of death on the cross. Now, that is our perfect model. I can tell you, if every one of us model after Jesus, I can tell you that we very less conflicts or problems within the church. The problem is we don't model after Christ. We don't model after Christ and we let our selfish ambition and pride all came about. And that, that is why the church will then have a problem. You know, I always like David Paulson's quote. He always said this, to be in heaven with all the saints that you know is glory, but to be to be on earth with all the saints that you know is another story. <laughs> it is so true. But I pray, I, I, I pray our, our, our church will grow to be strong in God, anointed, doing great exploits for Him and with Him, and I pray that we will also humble ourselves to love one another, to unite with one mind and one purpose in one strong spirit together. And I pray that with this encouragement from Paul, we will move on to greater heights. You know, when revival breaks out in many churches, you know what's the first thing that will happen usually? People walk across the aisles and hug each other and forgive each other. There's so many reports of this. People who have not talked to each other for 20 years, when they are convicted by the Spirit, when they are revived by the Lord, they walk across the aisle and they cry and they hug and they ask for forgiveness. Where the walls of animosity was being torn down, love flowed, and then the Spirit moved powerfully. I, 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 I pray that the Lord will just unite us strongly in His love and in His purpose. Shall we pray? Now today, this passage is simple. This may be a different night where we don't shout and scream. But it's, it's impor important to hearken to the words of God through His servant Paul in this beautiful book of Philippians. Let's ask the Lord to come check our hearts. Oh God. Someone offend us, be ready to go and say, Can we 
settle our disagreement because we belong to Christ. Oh God, come. Give us this humility. Give us this strength. bless us with this lesson from the book of Philippians. Let this lesson sink deep into our hearts. We ask of you, Lord. Amen. Can we just re respond to the Lord through some of the Steve, would you do this?
of studying exactly those passages. And even as I explained to them, two-thirds of the works of the flesh deal with division in the church. Partisan thought, separate ideas, allocation of position, and who's better than this. This one's of Paul, that one's of Paulus. And, um, and we don't see it that way. And um, it's an honor to serve Pastor Paul. And he walks in integrity. And he only wants to do what the Lord wants to do. And that's why I connected with him. It's a blessing to hear. It's a good word, a very good word. I love those kinds of messages. And like he said, it's true. If something challenges you, you feel it in your heart. Just make it right. Even if you suspect there might be a problem. Better that you go to somebody and say, hey, is there a problem? I'd rather have you do that and then them say, well, no, not really. It's better to be sure. Because it's so serious, you know, that you walk in harmony with each other, with different people. And uh, we have different strains of people in, uh, in this ministry because we have different nights, different groups. And so we can't help but have kind of a division sometimes in personalities of ministry. But that's part of the diversity of the body of Christ. But it's certainly it's my desire that we all be on the same page. And I know that we all love Jesus. And... We all love the Holy Ghost. We love the presence of the Lord. And we can walk in that. Thank you, Jesus. The fellowship of the Holy Spirit. But Paul a couple times mentioned it here in this passage, of course. The fellowship in the Spirit together. That giving to one another the koinonia of, of taking a bite out of each other's sandwiches. You know what? You can have as many bites of my sandwich as you want. <laughs> And I spent 10 years in Mexico where we lick each other's ice cream cones. I mean, nothing matters in Mexico. We suck on each other's troles. A trole is like a frozen uh, popsicle thing. And it's nothing for someone to suck on your popsicle and give it back to you. Uh, and you know, that's true. Even in, in Mexico, in southern Mexico, we had a church there that we had all things in common. It was like the church we see in the Book of Acts. There were long seasons where whatever, those seasons we as the church planners had nothing, no money, no food. And the church fed us. It's usually the other way around where the missionary has the money going to help the poor little people in the foreign country, but the tables turned for us. We were there, we had nothing, and the people fed us and cared for us. So when we had, conversely, we did the same thing. And that's real fellowship, and it makes the Lord so happy when we don't have any division between us. So Jesus. Thank you, Paul, for that good word. Lord, we're grateful for it. Seal these words to our heart. And let us allow it to go deep. Your word pierces deep. Divides us under the division of soul and spirit. And so let it do so. In dividing soul and spirit, it exposes motives of hearts, things, ideas. Lord, let us all see clearly inside of ourselves so that we can do the right thing and be pleasing to you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Let's give a hand.